Uh, so the human brain, it's really an incredible computing device. Uh, it weighs about two kilograms. It's composed of 86 billion neurons and about a quadrillion connections between those neurons. Uh, it consumes only about 20 watts of energy, and yet it's responsible for everything that humans have created, you know, art, language, computing, Python, which is why we're all here today. Uh, so I'm a theoretical neuroscientist, and what I do is I build models of the brain, uh, I build computer simulations of the brain, and today I want to tell you how we use Python to make those simulations. So it's worth first starting off with uh, why we want to simulate the brain. Uh, the first reason is that we want to understand it. So the late Richard Feynman, uh, shortly before his passing, wrote this on the blackboard, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So our opinion is that if we want to understand the brain, well, we, uh, the way that we're going to attack it is to try to build a model of one to replicate the function of the brain under the same types of, of constraints that the biological system is under. Uh, the second reason that we want to create uh, a model of the brain is to build better artificial intelligences. Uh, so there are pessimistic and optimistic examples of AIs in science fiction. Um, and hopefully today I can, I can uh, convince you that these pessimistic eventualities are not that likely, partly because it's very difficult to engineer these types of intelligences. It takes a lot of work, and so this type of emergent superintelligence is very unlikely to happen in practice. So the types of software that I'm going to tell you about today are called neural simulators. Uh, there's three very important uh, features of neural simulators that I'm going to talk about. Um, the first is that they attempt to emulate neurobiology at some level of abstraction. And as a consequence of emulating neurobiology, they operate in continuous time and they communicate with spikes. So I'll talk about a bit about what that means shortly. But I, I bring up these three kind of rules as a way to, to uh, differentiate neural simulators from other types of artificial neural network programs. So you may have heard about these um, kind of massively huge deep learning systems that Facebook and Google are using to process images and speech. Um, that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, these systems don't attempt to emulate neurobiology. Uh, in particular, they work in discrete time rather than continuous time, and they don't communicate with spikes. So the first neural simulator that I'm going to talk about is appropriately one of the oldest, yet it's still uh, being actively developed and in use today. It's called Neuron. Um, at its core, it's a C program with a graphical interface with some Python bindings. Uh, and so let's start it up. There's a little thing that it comes with called the Neuron Demo. So let's start up the Neuron Demo. Like I said, old program, old GUI. Um, so I'll load up this pyramidal example to give you a little bit of a sense of what I mean by neurobiology. So this is essentially uh, a simulated neuron. All of these processes around here, um, except for one of them, are called dendrites. And you can think of dendrites as providing input to this cell. And they provide their input as uh, current. All these dendrites converge upon this center point, the body of the cell, which we call the soma. And out of the soma, there will be one projection that provides output to other cells, which we call the axon. Um, so essentially, uh, it's an oversimplification. But one way to think about a neuron is essentially as a function that takes in inputs from its dendrites and provides a single output through its axon. So what Neuron is doing right now is called a current clamp experiment. So this I clamp here, uh, I stands for current. And essentially at this blue dot, there's a simulated electrode that's injecting a little bit of current into the soma of this cell. So if I run this model now, uh, over here, this graph populates. On the x-axis, we have uh, time in milliseconds. On the y-axis, we have uh, the voltage recorded from this cell. And just in this uh, kind of screenshot, we have the three features of neural simulators that I was talking about. So we're emulating neurobiology. We're working in continuous time. There's no discontinuities in this graph. And this upwards and downwards uh, stereotyped voltage trace uh, is called a spike. So if we move this, um, this current clamp to another part of the, of the uh, dendritic tree, we run it again, we no longer get a spike. So it's still some current is being injected, but it doesn't spike. Spikes are the ways, are the way, the single way that neurons communicate, at least in this oversimplified picture. Um, when, a, when a cell spikes, that spike travels down the axon and communicates a little bit of information to the downstream neurons. So as you can see, there's lots of things that we could do in this simulation, lots of variables we could uh, play around with. And so I'm going to play around with those a little bit 
in uh, Python using the Python bindings of Neuron. So this is going to be a simplified cell. Uh, just has two parts, a soma and a single dendrite. Uh, we set, essentially what we're doing here is setting some parameters. The length of our soma is going to be 40 micrometers uh, and 20 micrometers in diameter. We're going to insert some ion channels into there. Uh, the dendrite is going to be 150 micrometers long and 3 micrometers in diameter. Uh, has a different set of ion channels connected up together. And then to simulate our current clamp experiment, we, we uh, make this eye clamp object. We give it the thing that we're clamping the current of. Uh, we're going to inject, in this case, one nanoamp of current for 500 milliseconds. And then uh, what Neuron calls vectors are how we're essentially uh, collecting the data from that experiment. So we can initialize the voltage in this cell initial, uh, and then run it for 500 milliseconds. We can take the, uh, the time and the voltage and put them into NumPy arrays and then use matplotlib to create a plot of that membrane voltage over time. Uh, so in this 500 millisecond window, it spikes quite a bit. There's a lot of information being transmitted from this cell to its downstream cells. So you might be wondering how this simulation actually works. What are, what's kind of the math behind it? I won't go into that in very much detail, but I'll say that um, Neuron has built into it a number of mathematical equations that essentially emulate electrical physics. So we think of a, a neuron as kind of like an electrical device. Um, and there are more precise and less precise ways to emulate those physics. Um, if you wanted to write your own neuron model that is you know, either a more or less precise version of what neuron has built in, you can write it in uh, this language. It's kind of a domain-specific language for writing neuron models. Unfortunately, it's not Python. It's actually you know, not, not the worst language. If you're, uh, if you're a theoretical neuroscientist, all these things make sense to you. So, <laughs> um, so it's not too terrible a language, but it means that there's a two-step process for running your model. You have to compile this, then run your Python script, and that's not great. And so there's other neural simulators. Uh, the next one I'll talk about is called Brian. Brian is a neural simulator uh, implemented uh, entirely in Python, and it puts the equations behind these neurons kind of front and center. So an example, uh, example Brian script to create a neuron model uh, kind of has at its core this uh, string which defines the equations of these cells. So a complicated, complicated equation, don't expect you to actually like, understand it, um, but it's you know, just a string in that Python script which gets regenerated every time we run it. Uh, up here, we're just defining a bunch of parameters, and this shows off another nice feature of Brian, which is that it explicitly tracks the units associated with these parameters. So this reset voltage, for example, is negative 70.6 millivolts, which is very important for validation of models, making sure that you're doing the right thing. So we can create a what Brian calls a neuron group with those equations. We're just going to make one neuron in this case. We set its membrane voltage to that reset voltage, inject one and a half nanoamps of current, and when we, yep, so we can, uh, then we monitor the voltage from that cell and the spikes coming out of it, run it for 500 milliseconds, and we get something that looks very similar to what we had in Neuron. So across this 500 millisecond time window, we have a bunch of spikes. It kind of seems to slow spiking after a while. That's interesting, I suppose. Um, but to me, it's not you know, the most interesting thing. Because like I said, you know, this talk is about how to build a brain, but so far all I've showed you is how to simulate neurons. And to me, those two things are kind of qualitatively different. And so the question is, how do we scale up these uh, simulations from neural simulators, of which there are many? Uh, so these are eight examples in Python, but there are actually quite a few more. How do we scale up these types of simulations to something that's brain-like and you know, something that you could say has some kind of intelligence? So scaling from neurons to brains. Uh, people have been trying to tackle this problem for quite a while and have come up with a, fun, a bunch of different options, which I'm going to pull the audience to see what you think is, is the most promising. So one option uh, is to, so I should say, you know, scaling up, we know that we need an 86 billion neuron network. You know, you can just throw a bunch of computers at that. That'll happen eventually. That's fine. That's no problem. But it's the one quadrillion connections that's really the problem. Because how do you figure out how to connect these neurons up together? Each connection has a weight associated with it. You know, how do we figure out what are good weights? Um, so the first option is that you could just randomly generate a whole bunch of weights. And if, you're, if you really believe that the neuron is essential to what's happening in intelligence, it might be the case that it, uh, connecting them up randomly is sufficient. Um, the second option is to do some recordings from uh, brains to figure out the connectivity patterns, the statistics of connections in the, in the actual real brain. 
And uh, people do this in a field called con connectomics. And you basically get an idea of what's connected and the relative strength between those areas. Uh, the third option is to connect things up functionally. Um, so neuroscientists have essentially ascribed function, functional um, uh, functions to a bunch of brain areas. So at the back, you have visual areas, areas that process visual information, motor areas, kind of working memories out the front here. One way we could scale would be to kind of take a region of the brain and try to replicate its function in a brain-like way. So let's get a little quick show of hands, even though I've highly biased this crowd. Uh, but who thinks that option one, connecting these neurons randomly, is a, you know, might result in human-scale intelligence? Hands up for that. Good, we got a few hands, nice. Okay, what about option two? Think, uh, who thinks that the statistics are the most salient point and connecting them up that way will work? Also quite a few hands. Uh, what about option three? Hands up for if you think that the function is the most important part of things here. Apparently I did not bias you hard enough. <laughs> uh, so it seems that there's kind of an even split between statistics and function. Uh, in my lab, our Crystallisimus lab, uh, we're really dedicated to scaling things on a functional level. So we're interested in how are these neural networks, how are these networks of spiking neurons representing information, uh, transforming that information, and how can we use that to build uh, essentially functionally relevant brain net models. So the tool that we've created to do this is called Nengo. Uh, yeah, I should say that you know it's possible to come up with these functional networks in a very kind of precise methodological way of varying parameters and seeing if you get functional uh, networks. But uh, we think that tools are, are a tools really needed in this space. Um, so the tool that we create is called Nengo, and it connects neurons together using the principles of the neural engineering framework. Um, and just like the other neural simulators I've talked about to this point, uh, it attempts to emulate neural biology. It works in continuous time, and it communicates using spikes. So to this point, I've been talking about you know, neural spikes, and I've been showing you voltage traces. Um, and I want to, you know, we're talking about scaling up. And so the way that we scale up those voltage traces are to plot what I call, or what we call, spike rasters. So each of these vertical ticks represents a spike coming from a neuron. Uh, in our case, across the rows, we have uh, individual neurons. So this row shows you the spikes that this neuron emitted over time. Um, and there's clearly some pattern to this spike raster. You know, there's clearly a lot of activity around this part among a certain subset of the cells and a lot of activity over here for the other subset of the cells. And so how do we make any sense of this? How can we use uh, these neural, um, the neural firing patterns to represent information? Uh, fortunately, neurons don't respond in a, an entirely arbitrary way. Uh, we can kind of characterize the way that a particular neuron responds uh, with a tuning curve, which is what this is. So imagine that you're re recording from a neuron that's downstream from you know, the, the sensory part of your fingertip, your right fingertip. If you put a little bit of pressure, um, the nerve endings in your finger will send current down to that neuron. And the more pressure you put onto it, the more, cur the more current gets injected, and the more this cell will spike. So if you record this a lot, you can kind of average this out, and you get a curve like this. So if you're recording from this cell and you know that it's spiking at around 200 hertz, um, you can kind of make the, the judgment call that it's you know, representing a pressure amount that is kind of 0.1 in, on this scale. Um, of course, this is an idealized version of what really happens. Neurons are extremely noisy. Uh, you can record from the same neuron twice, and you'll get you know, slightly varying results. And so we really need to combine the responses of many neurons together to get an idea of what's happening. And so the way that we do that in Nengo is actually very analogous um, to binary coding. So um, you know, in computing, binary coding is how we represent information. Uh, if we wanted to represent, for example, the integer 13, we know that we can uh, encode that as the binary string 1101. Each of these uh, bits, each of these binary digits, represents a different power of 2. So at the low end, this 1 represents 2 to the 0 or 1. At the high end, this 1 represents 2 to the 3rd or 8. And knowing you know, what's true and false and what power of 2 these bits uh, represent, we, um, we can essentially do a weighted linear sum. So we weight the true or false value by the power of 2, add that all up, and we get back our originally encoded integer, 13, um, as our kind of decoding. Uh, 
So we're essentially encoding this integer into binary and decoding it back out. Uh, in, in binary code, this happens perfectly. Your computer never gets this wrong. They're pretty much always right. Uh, the neural code, analogously, if we're trying to encode a, uh, a number, like 0.5, this might represent kind of medium pressure on your finger. Um, the neurons that are sensitive to that quantity are going to spike at a certain rate. So say we have a neuron that's spiking at 23 hertz, 60 hertz, 3 hertz. Um, Nango will figure out a set of decoding weights, uh, D, associated with these neurons, such that we can do the same uh, weighted sum to get back an estimate of that originally encoded value. So 23 times our first decoder, 60 times our second decoder, et cetera, et cetera. You add all these things up, and you get a number that's close to 0.5. It's not exact, but in most cases, it's sufficient. So what essentially this gives us is a way to represent information, and we can use similar methods to transform that information. Um, and essentially what this allows us to do is to work on a higher level of, of abstraction than if we were just making neurons and connecting them together individually. So a good analogy for this is, is computers, uh, sorry, our compilers and computing. So you can think about this little snippet of C code, pretty understandable what it does, but if you go down to the assembler level, it's quite difficult to understand. And even this is just kind of a shorthand for binary instructions, also very hard to understand. And I think you can agree that if we were programming in assembler, you know, we wouldn't be at the state of computing that we're at right now. We certainly wouldn't be at a Python conference because it's another language. Um, Nango, analogously, is like a neural compiler. So we specify a neural model in terms of what information or what, uh, what values are being represented and transformed. So up here we have a node. A node is how we represent non-neural information. So kind of like the current that we injected in that current clap experiment, we need a way to somehow start off our simulations. So we call them nodes. Uh, ensembles are how we uh, represent information with populations of neurons. And so when we connect them, uh, in neuron, when you, uh, sorry, in Nengo, when you connect from a node to an ensemble, we're essentially figuring out how much current needs to be injected into that uh, population to represent the value that your node is encoding. Similarly, when you connect two populations together, in this case x and squared, um, we figure out the connection weights between them such that they transmit that information. And you can also transform that information across that connection. So in this case, uh, we're going to square the value in x and transmit that to squared hence the names. And under the hood, Nengo generates both randomly and through some optimization processes a bunch of numbers that would be a huge pain to figure out by hand. So the gain and bias on these neurons, which tells you how much current to inject, the decoding weights on this connection to actually implement that squared function. So let's look at this happening in Python code. Nengo is a Python library. So we take those uh, nodes and ensembles from before, we group them together in an uh, abstraction called a network, and then we add some probes in order to collect data over the course of the simulation. Uh, we create a simulator object, so nango.simulator, pass it the, the network that you want to simulate, we run it for a second, and uh, so let's look at the things that we've probed in that simulation. Um, so the first thing is the voltage coming out of just one of the neurons in the X population. You can see that just like in the other simulators, we're tracking very similar types of information. We can look at the voltage trace of this cell over time. We can also look at the spike raster. So thinking about all of the spikes that came out of our X population, uh, there's a pretty clear pattern here because we're just representing a constant value 0.5 <clears throat> that uh, all the cells are kind of spiking at a regular rate. Uh, but since we have this higher level of abstraction in Nango, we can also look at the value that these, um, these groups of neurons are representing over time. So our X population, the blue curve, uh, very quickly reaches a value of, of 0.5, which is what we were trying to encode in the first place. And our uh, squared population, the green curve, encodes X squared, which is about 2.25. We're doing a pretty OK job here. I should say it's not doing the best job, because what we've asked this network to do, represent uh, just a one value, is kind of an odd thing to do with these types of, of, of models. Like I said, they operate in continuous time, which means that um, you know, they're kind of dynamic systems. And so it makes, they, they work a lot better in dynamic situations. So what I could do is instead of having the output of my value node be a single value, I can change it to be a function of time. 
So in this case, I'm just changing the output of my value node, my val node, to be a sine wave. I simulate that network again. If we look at the voltage trace in uh, that neuron in X again, there are some areas here where it's not getting any injected current, and so there's, the voltage trace is kind of staying at a minimum value. If we look at the spike raster, we see now that there's kind of a clear pattern happening here that we have some cells that are sensitive to the start of the sine wave and other cells that are sensitive to the end of that sine wave. And if we decode out that value, uh, we get a pretty good representation of the sine wave that we were trying to in, uh, encode. So we get the up-down behavior in our X population, and we represent the square in this X squared population. So essentially, you can take these uh, two kind of ideas that Nengo is a neural compiler that uses a type of coding that's analogous to binary coding, a couple other ideas, and like 10 or so years of research, and you can build models that uh, work very functionally like the brain. So this is a model that we published a couple years ago called Spawn. Uh, and in it, we kind of figured out uh, functionally relevant uh, networks for vision, for uh, motor control, working memory, all these types of things. And we put all this together in a such a way that it can perform eight cognitive tasks. So it, this is it performing one of those tasks. And you'll see it write its answer at the end here, 555. Five, five. That's the right answer, in case you were curious. Um, I don't have time to go into the detail about Spawn, but if you're interested, I encourage you to check out uh, nango.ca for some videos of Spawn happening. You can read our, our paper. But what I want to highlight here by showing Spawn is that you know, Nango allows us to scale things up in, a, in an exciting way. Uh, one, of the other, one of the ways in particular that we uh, enable this type of scaling is with this new version of Nango that we just released. Um, you know, it took a lot of weeks of research and kind of tweaking to get Spawn to work. Uh, one of the components that was quite difficult is called the basal ganglia, and it essentially does action selection in Spawn. But now, with this new version of, of Nango, we can, anyone can, you know, install, pip install Nango and get the same basal ganglia in their models that we have in Spawn in just one line of code. Similarly, we've been working on ways of scaling up uh, that are specific to different types of computing platforms. So you can, um, you can get this Nango OCL package, which includes a simulator that will run the exact same Nango model, but it will run it using an OpenCL backend, which means that you can run it on GPUs. Uh, we also have a backend that runs on a, what's called a Spinnaker neuromorphic hardware, which is an exciting project coming out of Manchester, University of Manchester. Um, so these are all the ways that Nengo is helping scale up to the brain, to kind of the whole brain level. Uh, and if you're interested in these types of things, uh, you can go look at our GitHub organization, github.com slash Nengo. If you want to know lots of details, then I encourage you to check out my supervisor, Chris Elias Smith's book, How to Build a Brain. Uh, but I want to finish off uh, showing you one of the things that we're working on lately, which is a way to kind of interactively visualize what's happening in these types of, of networks. So, What's happening in this model isn't, isn't super important, but just know that there are two ensembles here, one with 1,000 uh, neurons, one with 100 neurons. This one's connected to itself. That one's connected to that uh, ensemble. And I'll start up our, the visualizer that we've been working on. So in here, we get kind of a, a miniature version of our network. So our stem node, the oscillator population, the shape population. If I press play, it starts simulating. You can see that this is indeed working in continuous time. Time is just flowing across that x-axis. Uh, we're generating spikes, and we're representing values. I can give this a little kick in our stim, and now it represents a function that we've encoded here, um, kind of an exotic function in a two-dimensional space. So you know, what, I, what I hope to kind of prove by this simulation and other types of things is that you know, our original goal, goal was to understand how the brain works and to build AIs. I, I hope this shows that, you know, we, we do actually know quite a bit about how the brain works, and using those ideas, we've been able to, to um, create a Python library that allows you to make, kind of, allows you to use these biological parts to create pretty exotic functions, uh, and you can scale that up to things like spawn. Um, but what we're working on right now is really the, uh, you know, more of the scaling part to build, uh, artificial intelligences that will help humans in the real world. So hopefully, you know, in five or 10 years, 
I can come back to PyCon and tell you about those projects. But for now, I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Thanks. All right, we have about five minutes for questions. If you want to go ahead and line up at the, uh, line up the microphone, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, go right ahead. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, I know that there exists a tiny worm, the, the C. elegans, yes. which has only 900 neurons, and yeah. they connect them. How they are connected is already known. Mm -hmm. uh, have you tried to simulate that nervous system? Yeah, so. So about C. elegans, you know, the, not only do we know how many neurons there are, we know kind of how they're connected. We have a very uh, detailed model, or sorry, I should say, we have a very detailed idea, kind of neuroscientifically, about what C. elegans' brain looks like. Um, there's a project called, so I should say that we haven't tried to simulate that ourselves, mostly because the types of neurons that we simulate are all kind of similar. Um, so pyramidal cells in your cortex are all kind of similar. And so you can kind of treat them in a similar way. But in kind of invertebrates and other lower organisms, uh, all of their neurons are very complicated. So you would really need a tool like Neuron that allows you to have a specific function for each um, neuron to make a kind of a C. elegans simulation. But there's a project called Open Worm that's doing that, which is uh, very cool. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if I could ask a question about one of the basic assumptions of your model. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, you use the functional model. How does that take into account people who lost part of their brain and have had other parts kind of compensate for that? Does that imply that brain location uh, is kind of agnostic to the function? Oh, yeah. So I should say that, um, so remember those models, we were making kind of discrete ensembles of neurons, right? So, you know, when we think about, when we build an angle model like this, it contains, you know, maybe, you know, 100 or 200 ensembles that are connected together, right? Um, those ensembles you would kind of hypothesize to be located in similar parts of the brain. So in Spawn, you know, we have a thousand or so, maybe thousands of ensembles. You can kind of say that each one of these ensembles is kind of um, part of a functionally relevant um, subnetwork, and that subnetwork you can kind of hypothesize to be in a particular region of the brain. So the parts of Spawn that are dedicated to visual processing, we would think of those to be in like V1 and V2. Um, and you can do similar things. It's not as detailed as a neuron where you actually say, you know, this is the spatial properties of the cell, but you can still kind of make analogies to, uh, you know, make hypotheses about what this ensemble, where this ensemble might be in the brain. Awesome. Thank you. Can we get the back of the room for a question? You mentioned sci-fi. Oh, hold on, sorry. Go ahead. You mentioned sci-fi. So in your professional opinion, what's mm -hmm. the best most interesting AI in science fiction? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. I actually watched Terminator specifically for this talk because, you know, it's happened a few times that people have come up to me and been like, so you're building Skynet? And I'm like, I don't think so, but I should watch the movie to find out. Um, you know, the problem with all these AIs in science fiction is that they're kind of under, under explained. I just want to know more about the details. Um, but, uh, you know. Hence my question. Yeah. Great. <laughs> For the room. Does this have general application to like machine learning, um, or as someone in the audience not trying to emulate a brain, mm -hmm. is there some way I could use this um, in a more general application? Yeah, so we're really hoping that that will be the case. But like I said, you know, um, we've really been em focusing on emulating neurobiology for now. Uh, we think that there are very important ways that this can be uh, applied in industry. Uh, the, really, the really kind of killer feature of spiking neural networks is that they're incredibly efficient. So I mentioned that uh, Spinnaker neuromorphic hardware, um, it can run on you know, three orders of magnitude less power than typical kind of conventional computing. The problem is that they don't know how to program their chips because they're just neural networks. They're, they're you know, simulating neurobiological systems. So um, we're hoping that Nango is going to be a way to program those types of chips to do interesting uh, kind of machine learning type functions. Thanks. Still a question from the back. Thanks. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. One question I had is it seems like, you know, for the most part, for the small systems, you sort of get back what you put in, which validates the code. Mm -hmm. But in terms of understanding um, or producing novel things, how, how complicated, how big do the systems need to get, and do you have to modify the code in other ways before you start to get sort of really meaningful functional behavior that you can ascribe to something similar that to what a brain would do? 
Mm -hmm. So I can tell you that we don't, you don't need to modify the code at all. Um, so that's been really a big push for this new version of Mango, is that in the old version, you know, we had to make a lot of modifications to get Spawn running. But now you can, you can basically take Mango to as it is, and you can run Spawn. Um, as, as far as how to build these models, it is really an art. Um, it takes a long time to kind of think about how you take basically time-varying vectors and functions on those vectors and with that, kind of compose it all into uh, a brain-like system. Um, and if you're interested, you're definitely, uh, you should definitely come work in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, if you go to our, uh, the GitHub page for Nango, uh, in the documentation, we have a, a long set of examples that kind of go from a simple network to a very complicated network. And if you look through those, through those examples, you should hopefully get a sense of um, kind of what that art is like. Excellent. Thank you. Let's take uh, two more questions from the front of the room. All right, thanks for your talk. Um, your, your system, you did a good job of demonstrating modeling at the neural level and the functional level. Mm -hmm. um, does it have any provisions for modeling at some of the intermediate, like the cortical column level or um, some of the other circuits? Right, so uh, yeah, so I would say that Actually, I would say that we're right now kind of at that intermediate stage because we've kind of focused on, you know, what are the functionally relevant subsystems, and then make a very reduced uh, model of that, and then connect that together. So Spawn only has two and a half million uh, simulated neurons, which is you know less than a tenth of a percent of the real brain. Um, so we've just kind of chosen little modules, and so if you wanted a more sophisticated visual system, you could kind of take the visual system that's in there and just scale it up, kind of in a obvious fashion of just increase the dimensionality, be more sensitive to more pixels, all that kind of stuff. So what we have now, um, and this abstraction that we call a network, is essentially that middle ground, where it's not an ensemble, it's like a group of ensembles, um, and that group of ensembles together compute kind of a, an interesting function, more interesting than just something that is in one layer. Thank you. Hi. Um, I've been told that the power of the brain was the capacity of reconnection of neurons. And so I'm just wondering, I've, have I been lied to? Or <laughs> <laughs> and the second question is, why don't you spawn uh, a random brain and just ask for reconnections? Um, sorry, can you, can you expand so, a little bit about what you mean by the power of the brain is? So I thought that neurons had the power of disconnecting and reconnecting between each other. Oh yeah, so one thing that I haven't talked about at all in this presentation is learning. So learning is really, you know, uh, how our brain works, how it goes from, you know, development all the way to a fully functioning adult. Um, so we do have, you know, the capacity to learn in Nengo. Uh, what I presented to you today is all based on kind of optimization methods, and what it gives you is essentially kind of a picture of the end result of learning. So there's a lot of work to do in figuring out ways to get from kind of just a blob of neurons uh, to figure out error signals such that you can, such that you can kind of as make these really complicated networks. That's so, kind of a separate line of research. So I guess my question is more, why can't you just spam a random brain and make it learn from scratch? Uh, definitely people are trying to do that. Okay. <laughs> but I can tell you that, that they haven't come up with anything as kind of functionally significant as uh, what we've done with Nango. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much, everyone, and thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Just a reminder, this is the last talks of the day. If you're going to one of the awesome PyCon dinners, you're probably going to have to book it on over there. Have a great evening, everyone.